Hello, my name is Travis Monk. This is one of a series of videos introducing biology, the study of life. This video will provide an overview and some examples of the chi-squared statistical test. Collecting data in an experiment is pretty fun and straightforward to do. You formulate a hypothesis and you carry out a plan to test it in a lab. When it comes to looking at your data, however, it can sometimes be difficult to determine if your results actually mean anything. Using this chi-squared analysis, this test, you can find, with different degrees of certainty, if the data that you collected in an experiment is due to random chance or not. The graphic on this slide will be used and described later. What it generally does is provide you with a visual for when to accept or reject your hypothesis. Scientifically speaking, you don't prove a hypothesis to be correct. You can only support it. What you can do, however, is reject a hypothesis. For this reason, when evaluating data, scientists use what is called a null hypothesis. When you carry out an experiment lab, you should have some experimental hypothesis, some explanation as to what you think is going to happen. This is not a null hypothesis. What a null hypothesis is, is the opposite, really, of your experimental hypothesis. What it is is a suggestion that the data that you've collected was just due to random chance. By rejecting your null hypothesis, you can support your experimental hypothesis. A great example for the null hypothesis involves the criminal court system in the United States, where defendants are presumed innocent. Since defendants are presumed in innocent, that is the null hypothesis. If the jury finds that the defendant is not guilty, they fail to reject the null hypothesis that the defendant is guilty. If the jury finds the defendant guilty, they reject the null hypothesis that the defendant is innocent. To determine if your data from an experiment is significant, you can perform a chi-squared statistical test. To do this, you'll need two different things. Number one, O, or observed values. Those are things that you actually measure during your experimentation. And the second thing are E, or expected values, uh, what you would expect to find in a given set of random data. An explanation of how you can find these different values, O and E, the observed and expected numbers, will be described in the upcoming slides. After you've determined what the observed and expected values are for your experiment, you need to plug them into the equation on the bottom right of this slide. There are a few different symbols in this formula that might look a little bit confusing, so I'll describe exactly what they are. First, the x squared in this equation, that is the chi-squared value, which is what you're going to be trying to solve for. Second is the big E that's found just to the right of the equals sign. That big E represents a, a sum of something. In this case, the sum of all the different observed minus expected values divided by the expected values. To really get a good understanding of what this means, I'm sure it's very confusing at this point, you'll have to look at an example using real numbers, which we'll take a look at in a few slides. Before we go through some real examples, however, there are two other things that you need to take into consideration for chi-squared analysis, and those are degrees of freedom and levels of significance. And those will be described on the next two slides. The level of significance in chi-squared analysis is, in essence, how confident that you want to be that your results are not due to random chance. Different levels of significance are shown in this probability graphic to the right. 0 0.05, 0 0.025, 0 0.01, 0 0.005, 0 0.001. 0 what these numbers provide is, in essence, what percent chance there is that your results could come from random chance. A critical value of 0 0.05 means that there is a 5% chance that your results could have been obtained through random luck. At 0 0.01 and 0 0.001, there would be a 1% and 0.1% chance, respectively, that your results were due to random chance. Any results to the left of the area on the graph corresponding to the different levels of significance would require that you accept your null hypothesis. Alternatively, any results to the right of the area on the graph corresponding to the different levels of significance would suggest that you reject your null hypothesis and accept your experimental hypothesis. As you can see from this graphic depicting the different levels of significance, there is a wider range of results that you can accept at the 0.05 level of significance than the 0.001 level of significance. You will always obtain values for the different levels of significance from a chart. They are not numbers that you would be expected to know, and typically in this class we will use the 0.05 level of significance. Degrees of freedom are the number of possible outcomes in a given event minus one. 
Flipping a coin, for instance, there are two possible outcomes, heads or tails. If you subtract one from the two possible outcomes, that leaves you with one degree of freedom. Rolling a typical six-sided dice, as another example, there are six possible outcomes, a one, two, three, four, five, or six. If you subtract one from the six possible outcomes, that leaves you with a five levels of degrees of freedom. When you analyze your results of a chi-squared test, you would take into account DF, or degrees of freedom, shown on the left side of this chart, as well as the different levels of significance. This chart only shows the 0.05 level of significance. If your result from the chi-squared test is greater than the chi-squared or x-squared value, then you would reject your null hypothesis. If your result is less than the chi-squared value, you would accept your null hypothesis. Finally, what we'll do is use a real data set to help you make some sense of this and understand how chi-squared analysis works. If you were playing craps or Monopoly at your friend's house and you were consistently losing, you might become suspicious that the dice are loaded, that ones seem to come up more frequently than they should randomly. What you could do is scientifically test that. The first thing you need to do in any scientific experiment is collect lots of data. Rolling the dice, as this problem suggests, 120 times should do the trick. The chi-squared equation provided to the top right and the table showing the different degrees of freedom at a 95% confidence or a .05 level of significance will be used throughout this problem. What I would do in this experiment is form a null hypothesis that suggests that the dice are not loaded, that there is an equally likely or random chance that any particular number will be rolled. First, let us define our observed values. Observed values, what they are, the numbers that you actually collect while you are running your experiment. In this circumstance, there were 27 ones, 25 twos, 11 threes, 19 fours, 18 fives, and 26 sixes. Your observed values would therefore be 27, 25, 11, 19, 18, and 20. Next, we'll determine what your expected value should be. Since there are 120 dice being rolled, and there are six different sides on your dice, you would expect 120 divided by 6, or 20 rolls on each of the six different numbers. Our expected values for each of the different sides would therefore be 20. With our observed and expected values defined, all you need to do is plug each of the different numbers into the equation separately. Again, x squared is the chi-squared number that you're trying to solve, and e is the sum. So you're going to take the sum of all of the different six observed values minus the expected values, square that, and then divide it by your expected value. Finally, what you do is you would add all those different numbers up. I've taken the liberty of showing you what plugging each of these numbers into the equation would look like using the observed and expected values in the order in which they're provided. After squaring the difference between the observed and expected values for each part of the problem, I came up with the following numerators. Add them all up, since you have the same denominator, and you have a 160. Divide the 160 by 20, and your final chi-squared value would be 8. Now all you need to do is analyze your data using the charts provided with different degrees of freedom and levels of significance to determine if you should accept or reject your null hypothesis. Since there were six possible outcomes in this scenario, there are six minus one, or five degrees of freedom. With this test, there was an experimental chi-squared value of 8. With 5 degrees of freedom and a level of significance of 0.05, the critical value is 11.07. Since the experimental value, or 8, was lower than the critical value, or 11.07, the null hypothesis is accepted. What this data means, in this circumstance, is that there was more than a 5% chance that the results uh, would have occurred randomly. You probably shouldn't accuse your friend of cheating in Monopoly because the dice probably aren't loaded. That is the end of this video summarizing chi-squared analysis. If you're interested in learning about any other specific biology concepts, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you.